Okay, so welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to talk about is synaptic vesicle exocytosis and also synaptic vesicle endocytosis. So really what we're going to talk about is the synaptic vesicle cycle, which involves both the exocytosis and then the endocytosis to recycle the vesicles. So synaptic vesicle exocytosis and endocytosis. Okay, right, so let me uh, talk about the structure then for this video. What we're going to start off with is a discussion of the big picture, okay? We're going to look at the synaptic vesicle cycle uh, in a big sense, okay? So we'll just look at exocytosis and endocytosis all together and see how it fits into this cycle that is occurring in the axon terminals of neurons, okay? Then what we will do is we'll have an in-depth study of the exocytosis process and then the endocytosis process. Now, when we study endocytosis, we're going to particularly study clathrin-mediated endocytosis because that uh, pathway is well understood, but there are other endocytic uh, pathways that are used within neurons. Okay, which we'll mention, <coughs> excuse me, in the uh, big picture that we're about to go over, but we won't go into the detailed study of those. Okay, right. So let's start off then with the big picture of what is happening in axon terminals. So let's start by having a large picture then of an axon terminal. Okay, so this is a classical axon terminal right at the end of an axon, and it's going to be releasing neurotransmitter onto some other uh, postsynaptic cell. Okay, so here is our axon terminal then. Right, uh, so basically most neurotransmitters are um, stored in synaptic vesicles prior to being uh, exocytosed and released by the axon terminal. Okay, and then these uh, vesicles will be stored in uh, the axon terminal cytoplasm awaiting an action potential to arrive and then we can release a few of these. Okay, so let's discuss this in more detail. So basically the precursors for synaptic vesicles, these come from the cell body of the neuron, so they travel along the axon and arrive in the axon terminal. Okay, so these are little membrane-bound vesicles that are the precursors to synaptic vesicles. So this is a synaptic vesicle precursor that is arriving uh, from the cell body uh, and it's coming along the axon. Okay, right. Then what ha will happen is it will get into the cytoplasm of the axon terminal here. Okay, and it's then going to be filled up with neurotransmitter. Okay, so neurotransmitter molecules are going to be made in the axon terminal cytoplasm all the time, and they're then going to be packaged into these synaptic vesicle precursors. Okay, so let's draw this. I'll draw the neurotransmitter molecules as these little green dots here. Okay, so now here is our synaptic vesicle now. So once you've got this a uh, little spherical vesicle uh, now packaged with neurotransmitter and is now actually known as a synaptic vesicle. Okay, now, in order for uh, a synaptic vesicle to actually be released when the action potential arrives in the axon terminal, the synaptic vesicle has to be um, docked and primed and ready to be released, okay? So in an axon terminal, you do have a lot of synaptic vesicles that are stored within the cytoplasm, but these are not the ones which will actually be released uh, quickly when the action potential arrives in the axon terminal. Instead, some synaptic vesicles are attached to the presynaptic membrane here, like so. So I'll draw these here. Okay, now, this portion of the membrane of the axon terminal, okay, this is known as the active zone, okay, so we say that the, um, the synaptic vesicles are docked at the active zone, they're attached to the active zone, and these are the vesicles that are actually going to be released uh, and are going to have their neurotransmitter contents released into the synaptic cleft when an action potential arrives. Now this uh, store of vesicles that are docked in the active zone and are ready to be uh, exocytosed when an action potential arrives, these are known as, let me just move this up, the readily releasable vesicle pool. 
okay the readily releasable vesicle pool okay so these are the ones which will actually be released very rapidly when an action potential arrives so i'll just put a few neurotransmitter molecules in them okay so here are the neurotransmitter molecules Okay, so let's discuss then how uh, you first the dock a synaptic vesicle into uh, this readily releasable vesicle pool, and then we'll discuss what happens when an action potential actually arrives. Okay, so basically there are two important processes here. Um, firstly, there is a process known as docking, and then there is priming. So basically a synaptic vesicle that is in the cytoplasm of the axon terminal, if it wants to dock at the active zone and become part of the readily releasable vesicle pool, there are two processes to this that are split into the actual docking process, okay, and then there's another process which is called priming, okay, so docking and also priming. Now, what do these two things mean? Okay, well, uh, docking uh, means literally this synaptic vesicle just binding to something in the active zone. So there are loads of proteins that are specialized to this zone of the axon terminal, the active zone of the axon terminal, and uh, many of these could potentially be interacting with the proteins that are in the membrane of the synaptic vesicle and helping it uh, to dock there. Okay, now, so docking is just the process of the synaptic vesicle binding to something in the active zone. Priming is more than that. Priming is actually getting the synaptic vesicle into a state where, if an action potential arrives in the axon terminal, it can actually be released. Okay, so docking literally means just bringing it into the active zone. Priming means getting it into a confirmation. Okay, setting up the necessary protein complexes such that when an action potential arrives, this one is now ready to actually be released, i.e. to be exocytosed. Okay, and we're going to have a look at priming a lot later on. Okay, and this is about the formation of the snare complexes. Okay, so we'll see the mechanisms of this later on. Docking is still a little bit more controversial as to whether the snare complexes are also the things which dock it. They're probably not. There are probably other things that are involved in docking. Okay, but those are a little bit more um, not as well understood. Okay, right, uh, so the synaptic vesicle is going to come and bind to proteins in this active zone that will bring it and attach it into the active zone and then you're going to set up special protein complexes between the presynaptic membrane here, so this is the presynaptic membrane and the vesicle membrane which are going to be called snare complexes and these snare complexes are going to get that synaptic vesicle ready so that it's utterly ready for um, exocytosis when an action potential arrives in the axon terminal. Okay, and we will study those snare complexes in more detail later on. Okay, right. So that's docking and priming. Now what we need to discuss is what actually happens when an action potential arrives in the axon terminal. Okay, so let's say then that an action potential is coming down the axon here. So here comes the action potential. It's going to arrive in the axon terminal. What then does it actually cause in the axon terminal? Well, it causes the opening of voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so let me draw one of these here. Okay, and these voltage-gated calcium channels will in fact be very, very close to uh, the docked and primed synaptic vesicles here. Okay, but for, uh, so that the picture looks nice, I'll draw it up here. So this is a voltage-gated calcium channel, or a VGCC for short. So this is a voltage gated calcium channel and basically when the action potential arrives in the axon terminal what will happen is it will activate the voltage gated calcium channel which is activated by depolarization so I'll color this thing in here in turquoise so here is the voltage gated calcium channel Okay, and when a voltage-gated calcium channel opens in the cell membrane, there's only one direction that calcium ions are ever going to move, and that's into the cell. Okay, so calcium concentration is much higher extracellularly than it is intracellularly. So whenever you open a voltage-gated calcium channel, you're always going to get calcium moving into the cell. 
Okay, so to give you some numbers there, uh, calcium concentration extracellularly is usually around 1.5 millimolar, whereas calcium concentration intracellularly is around 100 nanomolar, uh, usually. These are rough numbers. Okay, so that's a 15,000 fold gradient of calcium across the cell membrane, favoring the movement of calcium into the cell when you open that voltage gated calcium channel. Okay, so when you open these voltage gated calcium calcium channels because of the action potential you are going to get calcium coming into the cell and it's this calcium then that triggers uh, the completion of the exocytosis process. Okay, so we've discussed that we brought these synaptic vesicles in here. They've docked and then they've got primed, okay, they formed these snare complexes, which I might just represent like this. So here's a snare complex here. Basically, when calcium comes in, this completes the process. This activates the completion of the process. And what then is going to happen is if I draw another picture for this, I'm wondering where to do it. Uh, I'll try here. Okay, what's going to happen is you're going to form a little uh, connection between the lumen of the synaptic vesicle and the extracellular fluid, and we'll discuss this all in a lot more detail later on. Okay, but this little uh, pore that you have connecting the lumen of the synaptic vesicle to the extracellular fluid, uh, this is known as a fusion pore. Okay, now there are then two options for what can actually happen now. Okay, either the thing can go on to full collapse fusion, which is basically where it actually becomes part of the cell membrane, like so. The entire vesicle membrane just sort of collapses into the plasma membrane and it temporarily becomes part of the uh, plasma membrane. Okay, and that's supposed to be shown here. I'll sort of add a bit of color on to make this look a little bit more convincing. So here is the membrane of the synaptic vesicle, and now it's collapsed into the plasma membrane and just become part of it in this portion here. So this is full fusion, sometimes called full collapse fusion. Okay, so that's one option. The other option is that a phenomenon called kiss and run can occur. Okay, now in kiss and run, what occurs is the synaptic vesicle does form the fusion pore and a little bit of neurotransmitter is released um, into the synaptic cleft because a little bit can move through the fusion pore into the synaptic cleft. But then what happens is the fusion pore closes and the synaptic vesicle cleaves away from the membrane, like so, and goes back uh, into the cytoplasm of the axon terminal. Okay, and that's the fusion process in kiss and run fusion. All you do is allow a little bit of neurotransmitter to leave and go into the synaptic cleft because you open that fusion pore temporarily. Okay, so this phenomenon here is what's known as kiss and run fusion. Okay, and the mechanisms of that still aren't very well known. So all we're going to see about this is um, what I've shown you here in the big picture. We're not going to study the in-depth mechanisms of this because they're not very well understood. So this is what's known as kiss and run fusion. And people generally put kiss and run in quotation marks like this. Okay. Right, and of course this synaptic vesicle can then redock, reprime, and go through the process again. We're going to study the process of full fusion and then what can happen after full fusion. Okay, so after full fusion, you want to get the membrane of the synaptic vesicle back again. Okay, you have to understand that the membrane of the synaptic vesicle contains a bunch of very different proteins to the plasma membrane. So this portion of membrane here that you've added into the plasma membrane temporarily, it's very different from the membrane of the um, rest of the axon terminal. So you want to recollect this portion up again and return it to being a synaptic vesicle. Okay, so what's now going to happen is a process known as clathrin mediated endocytosis. So I'll just write this here. And this is the very well understood one. This is the one that we're going to uh, study in a lot of detail later on. So clathrin mediated endocytosis. And basically what's going to happen in clathrin mediated endocytosis is you're going to uh, re-collect uh, this membrane, re-pinch it off from the cell, uh, well, from the plasma membrane and reform the synaptic vesicle. So if I just show this, what you'll effectively do is reform a vesicle from the plasma membrane, pinch this off, and then uh, this will go, well actually first it will go to an organelle known as the early endosomes. I'll put this here. 
Okay, so this little vesicle that you're forming, this will be called an endocytic vesicle. Okay, so let me just, because there's a, a bit of confusion here that people generally have. They think an endosome is the same as an endocytic vesicle, and they're not. Okay, so I just want to make this clear. When you pinch off the membrane in this process of calathrin mediated endocytosis, you produce a little vesicle, like so. This is not an endosome. This is what's known as an endocytic vesicle. Okay. What will then happen is the endocytic vesicle goes to an intracellular organelle known as the early endosome. Now, the early endosome is much, much bigger than an, uh, an endocytic vesicle. It's a massive, great intracellular organelle. And basically, what happens is early endosomes come and fuse with it, uh, and then uh, little portions of membrane can be pinched off the early endosome, and these can form synaptic vesicles. Okay, so understand this picture is completely out of scale. The early endosome would be massive compared to an endocytic vesicle. Okay, so if I color code this because I'm running out of space to add annotations. So here in turquoise, this is representing an organelle known as the early endosome, which is a membrane-bound organelle where endocytic vesicles go to when they've first been produced. And then what you can do is pinch off little vesicles from the early endosome, and these can replace your synaptic vesicles. Okay, so basically before the endocytic vesicle actually returns to being a synaptic vesicle, it has to first go to the early endosome, uh, usually at least, and then uh, vesicles from the early endosome can be picked off and those can replace the synaptic vesicles. Okay, and this is the process we're going to discuss in a lot of detail, particularly this process of actually pinching off the membrane from the plasma membrane. Okay, the final thing that I should uh, just mention, another form of endocytosis that, again, we're not going to discuss at all because the mechanisms aren't well understood, is something known as bulk endocytosis. Okay, and in bulk endocytosis, what happens is huge great portions of membrane are pinched off. So let me show this. So basically, it's another endocytic process, but you pinch off massive great things, okay, like so. And this will then form a massive great vesicle here, okay, and uh, this massive great uh, membrane bound structure that you have just pinched off. This is what's known as an endocytic vacuole rather than an endocytic vesicle. So, this is an endocytic vacuole. Okay, and the process of pinching off an endocytic vacuole from the plasma membrane is called bulk endocytosis. Okay, so to color code this up, here is the endocytic vacuole here, and this was pinched off in a process called bulk endocytosis. Okay, and then what can happen is little synaptic vesicles can be pinched off the um, endocytic vacuole, and those can replace the endo, uh, sorry, the synaptic vesicles as well. So you can pinch little synaptic vesicles off the uh, endocytic uh, vacuole, and these can replace the synaptic vesicles that we're using up. And you might say, but do we really need to replace the uh, synaptic vesicles? After all, we're getting loads more synaptic vesicle precursors coming from uh, the cell body anyway. Well, the answer is yes, we do. This flow of synaptic vesicle precursors that is coming from the cell body is very slow. It's nowhere near fast enough, basically. Okay, If you want to maintain normal neurotransmission, you have to get a much bigger re-delivery of synaptic vesicles in order to maintain uh, your population of synaptic vesicles. Okay, and this has to be achieved through these endocytic pathways. Uh, so this isn't providing you with enough precursors to uh, cope with the demand for synaptic vesicles, basically, in normal neurotransmission. Okay, right. Uh, so that is the big picture of the synaptic vesicle cycle, so I should just give this its title. What we have just discussed is what's called the synaptic vesicle cycle, and it involves both the exocytosis processes and the endocytosis processes, so synaptic vesicle cycle. What we now are going to discuss is we're going to discuss the processes of exocytosis and endocytosis uh, in a lot more detail. Particularly, we're going to focus on clathrin-mediated endocytosis when we come to endocytosis. 
Okay, so we're going to start off with exocytosis. Okay, so uh, this involves the synaptic vesicles coming and docking at the active zone and then being primed. Now, as I hinted to earlier, the docking process isn't well understood. It could be a huge number of different proteins in the active zone that are responsible for attaching the synaptic vesicles into this active zone. However, the priming process is well understood. The priming process, which is the formation of these snare complexes, which get you ready to be exocytosed, that's very well understood. As to whether the snare complexes are also the things which actually dock the vesicles, that question is still open, basically. Uh, as I say, people think there are probably lots of other proteins that are actually involved in bringing uh, these synaptic vesicles to this active zone besides the snare complexes. But maybe the snare complexes do both dock the synaptic vesicles and prime them. Okay, right. Uh, so, the snare complexes then. We need to talk about snare proteins. So firstly, let's get over the terrible, terrible terminology here. So what does snare stand for? Okay, well snare stands for snap receptor. Okay, and then obviously that begs the question, what does snap stand for? Okay, well snap stands snap stands for soluble NSF attachment protein and then this just goes on and on so soluble NSF attachment protein so obviously the next question is what does NSF stand for and I'm afraid it goes on another time after that okay so soluble NSF attachment protein okay so what does NSF stand for it stands for NEM uh, sensitive factor so NEM sensitive factor and then finally what does NEM stand for and this time it doesn't go on again after that okay so NEM is a chemical uh, which we're not going to really discuss that much okay but this was involved in the initial experiments whereby people investigated these uh, proteins okay now NEM is the chemical n e malamide. okay so the N is for N E is for e and then malamide which has a really beautiful structure which we're uh, not going to go into. Okay, right, so that's the first terrible terminology of all of this, okay? Uh, and we will see the protein SNAP and NSF later on. They're they have a role much, much later on, okay? So snares are called SNAP receptors for a good reason, and that's because uh, complexes of NSF and SNAP do in fact bind to the snare proteins but their role in this entire synaptic vesicle cycle comes much later on, okay? They're actually involved in the recycling process, not the exocytosis process. Okay, right. Uh, so, what then do all snare proteins have in common? Well, the thing that they all have in common is a special motif known as the snare motif. So this is a really, really important concept. Okay, so all snare proteins have in common something known as a snare motif. So what is a snare motif? Well, basically, a snare motif is a very, very long alpha helix that is going to be involved in binding to other snare motifs. And in fact, snare motifs can uh, coil around one another. So let me just draw this. So basically, all the snare proteins are going to have very, very long alpha helical portions. Okay, so an alpha helix, remember, is basically a spring-like structure where the protein wraps itself around into a spring-like structure. Okay, so this is what a snare motif looks like. And basically, uh, well, the snare proteins are all going to have snare motifs in. In fact, one of them, SNAP25, which we'll see later on, is actually going to have two snare motifs in it. And basically, the idea is that the snare motifs can intertwine with one another. So if I try and show this, okay, so here is one of these snare motifs now shown here, and I'm sort of showing it a little bit wavy so that I can sort of show them intertwining. Okay, and then basically you can have another one sort of wrapping around this one, and it doesn't end there. You can also add more into this. So uh, at risk of ruining the picture, I will try and add another one in. So basically these things can sort of form these huge um, 
intertwined bundles, basically. And this is going to be really, really important for understanding the function of these things. So this motif is very, very important for the function of this, these things. In fact, this is how these snare proteins are going to hold the two membranes adjoin, adjoined, basically, because the snare proteins are going to have one in the synaptic vesicle membrane uh, and uh, loads in the uh, plasma membrane, and they're going to form a bundle like this that's going to hold the two membranes together. Okay, right. Now, the other thing then that I should say before we actually start looking at the snare proteins which are involved in uh, synaptic vesicle exocytosis uh, is that there are four different types of snare motif, okay? There are what is known as the QA snare motif, there is a QB snare motif, there is a QC snare motif, and there is an R snare motif. And in this video, we are going to see snare proteins which have every single one of these different types of snare motif. So there are four distinct types of snare motif. And in fact, what's going to happen in the formation of these uh, snare motif bundles, you're actually going to get one of each of these snare motifs in a bundle of four of them, basically. And it's going to form a four alpha helix bundle, which we'll see later. So I've only drawn three here. Really, we need one more adding on to there to make the four alpha helix bundle that we're going to see later on. Okay, right. The other thing that I should say whilst we're just on the topic of general snare proteins is that these are actually involved um, in membrane fusion all over the place, not just in synaptic vesicle exocytosis. Synaptic vesicle exocytosis is one of the key examples, an incredibly important physiological example of where these are involved. Uh, but they're actually involved in uh, fusing membranes all over the place in human cells and also all over the place in other cells, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, non-human cells. So this is a massive, massive uh, class of proteins, basically, that is very evolutionarily conserved. Okay, so now then, let's start with the actual details of how you um, prime a synaptic vesicle, the formation of these snare complexes between uh, the snares in the membrane of the synaptic vesicle and the snares in the plasma membrane. Okay, so once again, I'll stress this point that these snare complexes are absolutely involved in the priming process, but whether they are the only thing involved in the docking process is another matter. Okay, we think there are probably other proteins that are involved in initially bringing the synaptic vesicle and attaching it into the active zone, and then the snare complex is formed to prime the synaptic vesicle for exocytosis. Okay, so let's now talk then about uh, the snare proteins that are going to be involved in this priming process. Okay, so the first thing that I should say is that there are, well, so that snare proteins are divided classically into two, um, two opposing classes in this synaptic vesicle exocytosis process. Okay, so there are the T snares, okay, which stands for the target snare proteins. Okay, so this is for target, and these are just the. This is just a word meaning the snare proteins which are in the plasma membrane. So this is a, a term for those that are in the plasma membrane. And then there are also the V snares, and you can probably guess what this stands for. These are the ones which are in the synaptic vesicle. So this stands for vesicular snares, and these are the ones that are in the synaptic vesicle. So what's going to happen is uh, in the process of synaptic vesicle exocytosis, you're going to get complexes forming between the V-snares and the T-snares, okay? And this is going to be important in the priming process. Okay, right. So we're going to start off then by uh, discussing an example. Well, we're going to start off by discussing the target snares. Okay, so the first target snare that we're going to look at is syntaxin 1. Okay, so this is the one we're going to start off with, and then we'll go on to SNAP25, and then we'll do the V-snare, which is SNAP to Brevin. Okay, so let's start off then with the structure of syntaxin 1. So this is one that's in the plasma membrane. Okay, so I'm going to draw the plasma membrane here. 
So I'm going to draw two parallel lines here, which are going to represent the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. And note, I'm using the upper line to represent the inner leaflet. So that means that this side is the cytoplasmic side. Okay, And uh, I'm going to use the bottom layer to represent the outer leaflet. And therefore, this is the extracellular fluid side. Now, that's upside down to the way I usually uh, show plasma membranes. Usually, I use the top portion to show the extracellular fluid and the bottom portion to show the cytoplasm. But we're doing it backwards today. Okay. So, uh, let's have a look at the protein syntaxin 1. So, syntaxin 1 is an integral membrane protein. It has a membrane spanning alpha helix. So, let's show this. So it's a single polypeptide rather than a complex. So here is its C-terminus, which is on the extracellular side. Then we have our membrane-spanning alpha helix here in red. And that membrane-spanning alpha helix is known as the transmembrane region, the TMR. So this stands for the transmembrane, that's the TM, and then region, okay? And uh, f within all of the snare protein, well, many of the snare proteins, you have a transmembrane region. Not all of them. We'll see an example later of where you don't have a transmembrane region. Okay, right. Uh, then uh, the next important portion of uh, the syntaxin 1 is that you have your snare motif, which is going to be here. Now, I'm not going to actually draw it as an uh, alpha helix, but it is an alpha helix, okay? Uh, it just makes the picture more difficult to draw and harder to look at if you draw it uh, as an alpha helix. But this is the snare motif, so I'll colour it in rather than uh, showing it as an alpha helix, okay? So just as I didn't actually show the membrane-spanning alpha helix as an alpha helix, uh, I'm not going to show the snare motif as an alpha helix even though they are alpha helices. Okay, right. Uh, now, specifically, the snare motif of syntaxin 1 is a QA snare motif. Okay, then after the snare motif, what you have is a cluster of three alpha helices, which are all sitting alongside one another. So I'll color these in in orange. So here's one alpha helix, here's a second one, and here's a third one. And those three alpha helices are all uh, clustered together in a bundle. And this is what's known as the HABC domain. Okay, so this cluster of three alpha helices all together, that's known as the HABC domain. And then you have the amino terminus of syntaxin 1 here. Okay, now, importantly, syntaxin 1 has two conformations. The conformation that I have just shown you is what's known as the open conformation of syntaxin 1. This is the conformation in which it can actually interact with other snare proteins and form snare complexes, where the snare motif is going to intertwine with other snare motifs. Okay, but syntaxin 1 actually has another uh, conformation called the closed conformation, we and we now need to study that. Okay, so what I've just shown you is the open conformation of syntaxin 1. Let's now draw the closed conformation of syntaxin 1. Okay, so again, here is the plasma membrane. Same uh, protocol as before. The bottom portion is the extracellular fluid. The top portion is the cytoplasm. And in the closed conformation of syntaxin 1, uh, which I'll draw, I'm going to draw it upright for now, okay? Um, so uh, what you're going to have then is the HABC domain folded back down against the QA domain. Now, the, the fact that I've drawn it upright, that's not the important point about this. The important point about the closed conformation is that this portion here is going to be folded back on top of the QA motif. The fact that I've just sort of moved the QA motif to being represented upright uh, isn't the important change here. Okay, uh, this is, you know, this, this is going to be flexible. It can move around a bit. Okay, right, so this is the transmembrane region again here. This is the C-terminal here. And then what we have now is the uh, three alpha helices of the HABC domain folded back against uh, the QA snare motif. So here is the QA snare motif. Here is the HABC domain. Okay, and then you have the amino terminus here. Okay, and this is now the closed conformation 
of syntax in one. And I want to stress again, I could have equally drawn this uh, on its side like this and just have the HABC domain folded back against it. I'm drawing it like this because it's going to help us later on. Uh, well, in fact, in the next picture when I want to add Monk18 in. Okay, it's much easier to show Monk18 added on if I draw the picture like this. So don't concentrate on the fact that I have now made the QA motif erect. Instead, <laughs> concentrate on the fact that I have um, moved the HABC motif so that it is now flat against the top portion of the QA motif. Okay, right, so this is the closed confirmation. And in this closed confirmation, syntaxin 1 cannot interact with other snare proteins. It can't form a snare complex with other snare motifs whilst this HABC domain is blocking the top portion of its snare motif. Okay, and we'll see later on that the reason this is is because when you form snare motifs, when you form these intertwinings of these, uh, sorry, when you form snare complexes, uh, when you form these intertwinings of snare motifs, what has to happen is it's the amino terminal portions of the snare motifs, which is this portion up here. Uh, this is the C terminal portion of the snare motif here. It's the amino terminal portions of the snare motifs that first start to intertwine, and then the intertwining spreads from the amino terminus end to the C terminus end. So if you blocked the amino terminal portion of the snare motif of this syntaxin 1 protein by folding the HABC domain against that portion, then it's not going to be able to interact with the other snare motifs that it could interact with to form a snare complex, uh, and therefore you're not going to begin the process of snare complex formation. So this is going to block the formation of snare complexes. Okay, so syntaxin 1 has these two confirmations, the open confirmation and the closed confirmation. Now, the next thing that I want to introduce is a protein known as MUNC18. Okay, let me just move this up a little bit. So, MUNC18. Now, MUNC18 is still a bit of a mystery. It's still a little bit controversial what MUNC18 actually does. But I'm going to present you a model that is that probably has some truth in it. Okay, so I should say that a lot of what we're going to discuss in this video is not set in stone yet. It is still controversial. It may change in the future, okay? But it's the best model that we have at the moment. Okay, it's the leading model that we have at the moment. Okay, so, MUNC18, let me tell you a little bit about what is actually known about MUNC18 before I show you the model of what it actually does. Okay, what is known about MUNC18 is that it is absolutely essential for synaptic vesicle exocytosis in neurons. If you knock MUNC18 out, you no longer get any exocytosis at all from your neurons. Okay, so this protein is utterly essential, okay? And we still don't really know why completely, although we do have a model that would explain why uh, it is so essential. Okay, so that's what I'm about to show you. And this is the leading model for what MUNC18 does. So MUNC18 binds to syntaxin 1 when it is in this closed confirmation here, and also, in fact, when it's in the open confirmation. But it seems to stabilize syntaxin 1 in the closed confirmation. So let me just draw this here. Okay, and this is why I went from drawing the syntaxin 1 like this to drawing it like this, because it's easier now to show the MUNC18 bound when it looks like this. Okay, right, so here then is my syntaxin 1 protein in the closed confirmation with this HABC motif folded back against the QA snare motif. Okay, so let's uh, colour different portions in here. Here is the QA motif here, okay. Here is the transmembrane region in red there. Okay, and then we have the HABC domain here in orange. Okay, now MUNC18 then is capable of binding to this portion of the syntaxin 1, like so. So it binds to the HABC portion uh, and uh, the po this portion of the um, snare motif here, this amino terminal portion of the QA snare motif. So this is QA here, and I'll also label up the HABC domain in orange there. Okay, right, so 
I will then colour in Monk 18 in purple like so. Right, so what do we believe then that the role of Monk 18 is? We believe Monk 18 might be very important in targeting Syntaxin 1 to the active zone of the plasma membrane of the axon terminal. Okay, so basically, you know, if you're making syntaxin 1 and it's going into the plasma membrane, there's no guarantee that it's going to actually end up in the active zone of the axon terminal membrane. Okay, we think MONK18 might be really, really important in bringing syntaxin 1 to the active zone and also in stopping syntaxin 1 from being able to interact with anything until it actually gets into the active zone. Okay, and that would explain why MONK18 knockouts have huge problems with exocytosis. In fact, it's so extreme that you have no exocytosis at all, because the syntaxin 1 just would not be getting into the active zone, potentially, is the explanation there. Okay, so we think that might be the role of MONK18, to bring the syntaxin 1 into the active zone portion. Okay, now, uh, the problem is that currently, with the MONK18 bound like that, around the syntaxin 1 and the syntaxin 1 in the closed conformation, that even if it does bring it into the active zone, you can't actually do anything with the syntaxin 1 at the moment. It can't actually form any uh, snare complexes at all. So now what needs to happen is uh, the MONK18 needs to change its hold of the syntaxin 1 so that the syntaxin 1 can move into the open conformation and then uh, we can form uh, some um, snare complexes basically. Okay, right. So before we actually move on to uh, how you're going to change the conformation of syntaxin 1, let me firstly introduce another snare protein, okay? The other snare protein that is also in the plasma membrane and therefore is another target snare uh, which is going to be involved in the formation of these snare complexes. Okay, so the other one that I want to introduce is what's known as SNAP25. Now I want to stress that SNAP25 is absolutely no relation whatsoever to these SNAPs here, solid awareness F attachment proteins. It's nothing to do with those, a very, very different function to those. Okay, so don't get that, that confuse you. Okay, so now let's draw SNAP25 also in the plasma membrane. So here we have our syntaxin 1 in the closed conformation with the MONK18 bound to it, and it's arrived in the active zone portion of plasma membrane, so in this presynaptic membrane. Okay, SNAP25 is also in this portion, so let me now show you the structure of SNAP25. Okay, so SNAP25 actually has two snare motifs. Okay. And these snare motifs are QB and QC snare motifs. Okay, so let's show these here. So the one that's closer to the amino terminus, that's the QB snare motif. And the one that's closer to the C terminus, that's the QC snare motif. So this is a QB snare motif, and this is a QC snare motif. Okay, and now SNAP25 does not actually have a transmembrane region. Instead, what it has is lipid molecules attached onto it, which bind into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer and therefore hold it at uh, the phospholipid bilayer. So it's attached to the phospholipid bilayer rather than being implanted into the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, so the basic principle here is that you have attached lipid molecules. If you want the specific details, it's palmitoyl groups. Okay, uh, so lipid moieties onto the protein and basically, these are extremely hydrophobic, so you've stuck an extremely hydrophobic side chain off the SNAP25, okay? And these molecules will not interact at all well with water, so what will end up happening is these will implant into the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, and that will then leave the rest of the SNAP25 dangling in the cytoplasm, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so that then is the other T snare, and now we've got three snare motifs. Okay, and now what needs to happen basically is you need to form what's known as a snare acceptor complex. Okay, so the next step in this process is the formation of what's known as a snare acceptor complex. 
Okay, so the first part of the uh, formation of a snare complex um, at these uh, synaptic vesicle sites is for the two T snares to firstly start to intertwine together and then the V snare, which we haven't seen yet, that's going to come and join the fun later on. Okay, so what we firstly need to do is form what's known as a snare acceptor complex, which is where uh, the syntaxin 1 snare motif, which is QA, is going to bind to the SNAP25's snare motifs, which are QB and QC. Okay, now at the moment we can't do this because the MUNK18 is bound to the syntaxin 1, which is in the closed conformation. So syntaxin 1 isn't at the moment in a conformation where it can actually bind to the SNAP25 and form an acceptor snare complex. Okay, uh, so instead, what needs to happen now is that. Uh, we need to change the conformation of the syntaxin 1 so that it's now in the open conformation. And it's believed that proteins in the active zone are very important in triggering this. In addition, another protein known as MUNC13 is believed to be very important in doing this. So let me show you this. So what's believed to happen is MUNC13, along with uh, potentially other proteins in the active zone of the axon terminal, are going to bind to MUNC18. So remember, the role of MUNC18 was to bring the syntaxin 1 to uh, the active zone. Let's say it's now arrived in the active zone. What now is going to happen is MUNC13 and other proteins that are in the active zone are going to unpackage the syntaxin 1, basically. So what's going to happen then is if I draw this, let's say this is the plasma membrane here, and let's draw our syntaxin 1 again. So here is the C-terminus of our syntaxin 1, and I'll just move this up a bit. And now what's going to happen is you're going to move the syntaxin 1 into the open conformation. Okay, so now here is the Q, uh, sorry, the HABC domain here, and this is the end terminus of our uh, syntaxin 1. And the way that you're going to do this is by other proteins binding to the MUNC18 protein. Okay, so here is MUNC18 still bound to the HABC in the end terminus, but no longer uh, in with the syntaxin 1 in the closed conformation. Okay, and the reason this change has occurred is that some other proteins are bound up here. One of them is MUNC13 and maybe other active zone proteins which are represented as this blob here. Okay, so active zone proteins. Okay, so potentially other things that are in the active zone that aren't fully understood yet. Okay, so let's cover this in to make it more obvious. So, this is MUNC18 here. Okay, it's still most likely bound to the syntaxin 1, and this is actually uh, a controversy that still stands, whether the MUNC18 remains bound at all. Overall, we think it might do. Okay, so I'm going to show it remaining bound, but it might not. It may well fall off completely. Okay, so here then is the HABC domain, which we're still bound to, and the N-terminus there. But now, the QA snare motif of syntaxin 1 is on its own. Okay, so we've moved the syntaxin 1 from being in the closed conformation to being in the open conformation. And now let's colour in these other proteins, not in our green because we're using that later. We'll have MUNC13 in yellow here. Okay, and we'll have... Uh, other active zone proteins in blue here. I've just realized I've messed that up because I underlined MUNC13 in blue before, but never mind. Okay, so basically the idea then is that other active zone proteins along with MUNC13, which is also in the active zone, combined to MUNC18 uh, that is bound to the syntaxin 1 and cause it to change its conformation so that now the syntaxin 1 moves into the open conformation, and the MUNC18 remains bound just now to the HABC domain and the amino terminus of the syntaxin 1, but not to the QA snare motif. So the, whoops, so the QA snare motif is now free to interact with other snare motifs. Okay, so that's what the role of MUNC13 and potentially other active zone proteins is. And again, MUNC13 is an utterly essential protein. If you knock MUNC13 out, neurons no longer have any synaptic vesicle exocytosis. So without MUNC13, 
V-sequexocytosis is completely stopped. Okay, right. Now then, what can happen is the QA snare motif of um, syntaxin 1 can form a snare acceptor complex with the QB and QC snare motifs of SNAP25. So let's draw this here. So let's put snare SNAP25 here. Okay, so I'm going to stop showing the N and C terminus of SNAP25 because it just makes the diagram look cluttered. Okay, here are the two snare motifs of SNAP25 here in green. And these are now going to be intertwining, even though I haven't shown it as an intertwining um, structure, they are going to be intertwining. But it, just to make the picture look simple, I've just shown it as them lying parallel to one another. Okay, right. So what's now happened is syntaxin one snare motif has interact with, with the two snare motifs of SNAP25, and that now has formed our uh, snare acceptor complex. Okay, so that's all preparation basically for the arrival of the synaptic vesicle. Okay, so that we haven't even seen the synaptic vesicle yet. That was all just preparation of the snare acceptor complex for the arrival of the synaptic vesicle. Okay, so let's now discuss the synaptic vesicle. So I'll put my synaptic vesicle here. Now I'm going to show my synaptic vesicle membrane once again as uh, a phospholipid by there. So I'm going to have two separate lines here like so. Okay, right. Now, in the synaptic vesicle membrane, you also have snare proteins. Well, um, one specific type of snare protein is particularly important, but of course you have multiple uh, copies of this snare protein in the synaptic vesicle membrane. Okay, so I'll draw this here. So, it's got a nice simple structure. It's got a transmembrane region, which again, I'll colour in in, R, in red here. Okay. And its C terminus is in the lumen of the synaptic vesicle, its amino terminus is in the uh, cytoplasm, and then here is its snare motif. Okay, and it's got the final remaining snare motif type. Okay, so this is now an R snare motif. Okay, and this snare protein is what's known as synaptobrevin. Okay, now synaptobrevin also has another name. You might also hear synaptobrevin called VAMP. Okay, now VAMP is its older name. It stands for vesicle, that's the V, and then associated, so we should have a little dash there, vesicle associated, that's the A, and then membrane protein is the MP. So vesicle associated membrane protein is another name for synaptobrevin, the old name for synaptobrevin. Okay, and now this is the final component of the formation of this um, four alpha helix bundle. Basically, what's going to happen now is this R um, snare motif is going to join this snare acceptor complex that we have here to form a bundle for alpha helices, and that's going to make the uh, final snare complex. Okay, right. Now, just before I draw the next picture, what I want to say is that when you get this synaptic vesicle forming a snare complex with the plasma membrane, you're not just going to get one of them. Okay, when the synaptic vesicle comes and is primed for exocytosis by the formation of these snare complexes, you're going to have loads of these snare acceptor complexes in the plasma membrane. And you're going to have many copies of synaptobrevin in the synaptic vesicle membrane. So what can happen is you can form many, many of these um, snare complexes, which we're about to show. Okay, so what I'm going to do, and what the classical way of showing this is, I'm going to show two of them in a cross-section picture, okay? It looks nice when you do this. In reality, there could be more than two, okay? Uh, so let me now show this picture. But previously, we've just been showing one, so I thought that that speech was necessary there. Okay, right. So, this is a big picture, so get lots of space ready for this. So, here is the synaptic vesicle. Okay, like so. And once again, I'll show its membrane as a lipid by there, rather than just as a single line. Okay, then what we'll have, and I'll leave lots of space, here is the plasma membrane down here. Right, so let's begin by putting our snare acceptor complexes in, and then we'll put our uh, synaptobrevin proteins onto those. 
Okay, right. Uh, so, the first thing then, I'll start by putting in syntax in one. Now, as I say, we're going to show two of these complexes, one on either side, so it's nicely symmetric and it makes the picture look lovely. Okay, so here is syntax in one, and it's now in this open confirmation. So here is that HABC domain, potentially, and again I say potentially, still with the monk 18 bound. This is still controversial as to whether the monk 18 remains bound or whether it drops off. And then if it is still bound, it most likely still has the monk 13 bound and the other active zone proteins bound here. Okay, so let's now make it symmetric on both sides. So here we have our other syntax in one. Here is its HABC domain, like so. Here is the MONK18 protein on this side, potentially still bound to that HABC domain and the N terminus of the syntax in one. And then you have the MONK13 proteins and the other active zone proteins. So let's start by colouring in this um, portion of this picture. Okay, so here is the transmembrane region of syntax in one. Okay, here is um, the um, QA snare region of syntax in one here in turquoise. Okay, then we have the HABC domain in orange here, like so. And then monk fit, sorry, monk 18, I think we previously showed in purple, so I'll try and continue that on. So here is monk 18 in purple. And again, I'll stress that it's potentially still bound there. It might not be bound there at all anymore. It might cleave off. Okay, but here is monk 18 if it's still there. Uh, then what we'll have is monk 13, which I'll colour in yellow here. And then potentially other active zone proteins also bound to the monk 18 uh, in blue. And they're responsible, remember, for the monk 18 changing the way it's bound to the syntax in one so that it's now bound to just the HABC domain and the amino terminus of the syntax in one. And it basically now holds the syntax in one in the open confirmation. Okay, then what we want to add on is SNAP25. So two SNAP25s here. There's one SNAP25 with these lipid moieties attaching it into uh, the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. And then we'll have another SNAP25 here, again with lipid moieties attaching it to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. Okay, and again, I'll colour in these snare motifs of SNAP25 in green here. And I'll show those lipid moieties, which are also important to be on the picture in turquoise. Okay, so that's SNAP25. And now let's put in SNAPDOBREVIN. Okay, so here then is SNAPDOBREVIN. Its C terminus is in the lumen, its N terminus is in the cytoplasm. And again, we'll have another one here. So here's the C terminus, here's the N terminus. And then here is its final snare motif. And remember, it's an R snare motif. So remember, we've got one of each of the four different types of snare motifs here. The uh, syntax in one provides the QA snare motif. The SNAP25 provides the uh, QB and QC snare motifs. And the SNAPDOBREVIN or VAMP provides the R snare motif. And this complex that we've now formed here, this is the four alpha helix bundle. Okay, so this is the four alpha helix bundle, as it's called. Okay, uh, and often this will be referred to as a snare complex or a trans snare complex. Now, I need to add something into this picture very quickly, okay, because if I tell you this, if I give you this picture, this this apparatus, as it stands, would fuse these two membranes together, okay? So let me just explain what has happened here. Basically, these alpha helices, the, of these snare motifs here of the free snare proteins, okay, are zippering together, basically. They're forming these um, intertwined bundles, basically, and it starts at the amino terminus, and it spreads back to the C terminus and this releases a huge amount of energy and it pulls these two membranes together. It pulls the membrane of the synaptic vesicle and the plasma membrane incredibly close together. Now that's difficult to do. I acknowledge that that is difficult to do because phospholipids generally are negatively charged. 
Okay, so you're bringing two negatively charged structures close together. That's not easy to do because of electrostatic repulsion. So that's why the energy released by this formation of the four alpha helix bundle is incredibly important so that we can overcome the energy barrier of bringing uh, these two negatively charged structures together. Okay, now, uh, as I say, if you just let this go, what would happen is it would bring these so close together that they would actually fuse, okay? At least this is the leading model for what would happen, okay? Uh, so, what actually has to happen is something else has to bind here, and this other thing is involved in stopping the final portion of this process. So there is a clamp, basically, on the exocytosis. There is a clamp that stops these snare motifs from completely zippering up right down to their C termini, because if they completely zipper up, then they will fuse these two membranes together. So what we need is something to bind here that stops the progression of the um, zippering process, okay? So I'll just put that key word. It's described as a zippering process, the zippering up of the snare motifs. Okay, and it's halted somewhere along the lines, basically. So you don't complete it all the way. So that's it. it's halted here. And if you took it all the way to the end, then it, that's what causes the actual fusion of the two membranes. So normally, in the priming process of synaptic vesicles, we have to stop this zippering up uh, before it actually completes, and then we only want it to complete when the calcium signal arrives, which is the indicator that an action potential has arrived. Okay, so the final protein that I need to add on to this picture is complexin. Okay, so I'll put this here. It's a little protein, again with an alpha helical structure. Okay, that's going to um, binds to the 4-alpha helix bundle here. So in red there, that protein is a complexin protein. And you've got one onto each of these uh, snare complexes. Okay, so the complexin protein is involved in stopping the final portion of the zippering up process. And basically, when the calcium signal arrives, we're going to cleave the complexin proteins off and then the zippering up process will complete and that will fuse the two membranes together. Okay, so complexin is described as the clamp protein basically. It clamps uh, the uh, snare complexes and stops them from completing their zippering up process which would lead to the fusion of the two membranes together. Okay, right. So one more piece of terminology before I call it there for this video, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video, okay, which is that this is now called a trans-snare complex. Okay, and that's a common piece of terminology that you'll hear uh, if you read the literature. Okay, right. So why is it called a trans-snare complex? Well, snare complex is fine, hopefully. We have got a complex of free snare proteins, so that's fine. Uh, trans. Trans means on the opposite side to. Okay, so this is called a trans-snare complex because it's formed by snare proteins that are in opposite membranes, basically. You've got proteins in the synaptic vesicle membrane and proteins in the plasma membrane uh, involved in the formation of it. And because these are on opposite membranes, it's therefore described as a trans-snare complex. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video where we'll look at how uh, the... Um, Fusion is actually triggered by the calcium signal.